गुड मॉर्निंग इट्स एक्साइटिंग फॉर अस दैट वी कैन हैव अ डे वेर वी कैन इनफोर्स टू आर सेल्स समथिंग विश वी इनफोर्सिंग एवरी डे दैट क्राइस्ट इज अलाइव आले लुया आले लुया ही इज अलाइव एंड ही लिव्स फॉर मोर एंड ही लिव्स इन अस एंड ही वॉन्ट्स टू डू थिंग्स थ्रू अस आले लुया आले लुया प्रेज गॉड there's so much hope we have because we have god in our life yeah there's so much hope and we see that even um, even when jesus was crucified he died and he was buried even the even the disciples didn't expect that he is going to rise again because the scripture portions i read you know it says they marvel they were amazed <laughs> so so there was a lot of hopelessness that set in the day that he was buried and even the scripture because there was deep darkness <laughs> you see and and many painters have uh, have tried to depict that there is a there is one particular painting uh in one museum where uh, the painter has painted jesus uh, and around around him is only black it's all black color <laughs> so to depict the hopelessness when he was dying that's there was such darkness such hopelessness and so the background of the painting is you see jesus you know you see jesus hanging on the cross in that painting and then it's all dark <laughs> so he is he's painted jesus uh, he's painted the cross and there is this dark it's all black around him it's all black there is it's a black background he he's put jesus on the black background <coughs> just to just to try and capture how much people felt hopeless and such darkness the world felt when jesus died and and got us buried and even the disciples they weren't expecting anything see we know the whole story but they didn't know the whole story and they felt so hopeless that day everybody felt so hopeless all the disciples felt hopeless <laughs> so but praise be to god when the lord raised from the dead and he appeared to them they had great hope and the fact that christ is alive is a reason of great hope for us hallelujah let's just uh, let's just go to luke 23 please and i just want to want to take you through the you know what happened after the burial of jesus so let's just go to luke luke chapter 23 let's go to 50 Luke twenty three fifty fifty five zero. Okay, so we we are going to uh, plug in where the Lord Jesus has been crucified and he's died, and now the now there's a man called Joseph, who's a member of the council, a good and righteous man. He comes and he says, "I want to bury the body of Jesus." Okay, so this and so. he had not consented to the plan and action we are told that this man had not consented to the plan and action of crucifying jesus he was a good man righteous man a man from arimathea a city of the jews and he was waiting for the kingdom of god okay he was waiting for the reign of king jesus this man went to pilate and asked for the body of jesus and he took it down and he wrapped it in linen clothes and he laid him in a tomb cut into the rock when no one had ever lain and we we even saw on the video that's how actually in the you know in the medieval times that's how they looked the graves so you it, and they rolled a stone in uh, you know and sealed it so so he took it down and wrapped him in linen clothes and he, and he, and jesus was laid in a tomb cut into rock where no one had ever been lain it was the preparation day and the sabbath was about to begin Now the women who had come with him out of Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared the spices and perfumes and on Sabbath they rested according to the commandment. It's important for us to read that he really did die because our sins were put on him and he was crushed for our sins. And he was buried and he did rise again because you see death cannot hold a sinless man. And if Jesus wouldn't have risen then we are in trouble then there is no price then we have to pay for our own sins then we have to punish for our own sins yeah 
So Jesus' resurrection is very important. Otherwise, all the claims of Christ become false. And another thing to really think about is, why would people be willing to go through so much torture in first century AD for a lie? Why would people be willing to go through so much torture for a lie? They were told that the disciples of the first century, they were told either you say that you don't believe in Jesus or we'll kill you. And they would say, no, we believe in Jesus, you can kill us. Why would people suffer if it was all a lie? <laughs> it makes no sense. You have to be mad. You have to be a lunatic to die for a lie. But if you die for the truth, then we say you are a person of conviction. We say you are a person of honest truth. And so we really need to also think about this. So many people went through so much torture in the first century AD for the faith in Christ. They were not lunatics that they would go through this torture for a lie. They were convinced that Christ Jesus died for their sins and he rose up on the third day. And he's alive forevermore. And that this Christ gives them eternal life. And so they stood for that truth. Martin Luther went through so much at the hands of the Catholic Church. He was not a lunatic. He was convinced about Christ. He was convinced that we are saved by faith and not by works. And he suffered so much. But he suffered because of the truth. He was convinced this is the truth. And he says, I cannot violate the voice of my conscience, he said to the Pope. I will not recant because I cannot violate my conscience, he said. He was so convinced from study of scripture that Christ Jesus came on the earth as a man. He took our sins upon himself. He died on that cross for us and he was raised on the third day and lives forevermore. And that you become a child of God by faith in the work of the cross and not because of any works or any kinds of indulgences or harsh treatment of the body, or, or many other things which the church, the Catholic Church at that time was doing. So, we've seen that now Christ has been buried. Now let's go to Luke 24. And the resurrection of Christ, even as uh, Chris had mentioned on Friday in his sermon, the, the crucifixion of Christ and the resurrection of Christ is a very historically proven fact. It's one of the most most proven facts of history. Even historians who don't know Christ, they have, they have acknowledged that Christ came and Christ died and he rose on the third day. So, uh, Luke 24, please. On the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb bringing spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Now, see, we, we also need to understand one more thing. It was, it was a serious matter to touch the tomb because the Romans had put their seal on it. If you mess around with the Roman seal, you're going to be killed. So let's also get that straight, that when Jesus was put inside this, this tomb and a rock was rolled over that tomb, the Roman seal was also put there. So, you know, we cannot say that some drunk lunatics must have rolled away the, the rock. No, people, people are scared of the seals. <laughs> okay. And, and also, it's very interesting, by, by God doing this, God was also showing them, showing to the world also, I am above every government, I am every power. And even by rolling away the rock, again, God was making a statement, I am more powerful than the most powerful kingdom here. <laughs> I don't care about their seals. I am not in any way, hindered by them and their seal. I'm more powerful than them. And I think it's important to remind ourselves in a time that we live in our country, that God is more powerful than any dispensation that is ruling any nation. And we need to remind ourselves from time to time and take heart and take courage that God is sovereign. What does sovereign mean? The one who rules and reigns over the realms of mankind. God is sovereign. He is not limited by the powers that are. Okay. So they found this, the, the stone has been rolled away from the tomb. Then. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Okay. While they were perplexed, confused 
about this. Behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothes. And as the women were terrified, and they bowed their face to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? That's such a beautiful statement. So the, the angels are telling these women, who were so devoted to Christ, saying, why are you seeking the living among the dead? Hallelujah. Why are you seeking the living among the dead? And then, he is not here, but he has risen. Can we say this? Christ has risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then the angels are now trying to remind them of certain things. Okay? The angels are saying, remember how Christ spoke to you while he was still in Galilee. Saying that the Son of Man. That's very interesting. Many times the Bible says Son of God, Son of Man. It's very important that we, we understand that Christ was 100% man, 100% God. And so every time the phrase Son of Man is expressed, we are... We are lifting up his humanity. And when we are son of God, we are lifting up the divinity. But he's the same person, 100% God, 100% man. Yeah. The son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men. He be crucified and the third day rise again. Now, the, now it's very interesting. The angels are telling them, why are you so getting so surprised when he was with you? He told you. <laughs> and I find this very interesting that all of them, who was so close to Jesus, they're all very depressed at the time of crucifixion, all very excited when finally appears to them. So what does that show? None of them believed the words of Jesus about his resurrection. So take heart. When you struggle with unbelief, or I can struggle with unbelief, God helps us, though we can sometimes struggle with issues of faith. God helps us. He reached out to all these guys, and strengthen all of them. He strengthened them. They didn't even believe his words. That I'm going to rise up. They didn't believe it. But he came and strengthened them. And so likewise there could be times when you could have a season. You could have things happen that are bringing doubt into your heart and mind. But take heart. God cares and he will strengthen you. And he will reassure you of himself and his claims and his words to you. Don't lose heart. And so, so this, is a, this is very interesting that the angels are reminding these precious women that he told you, he said that the Son of Man must be delivered in the hands of sinful men. He will be crucified and the third day rise again. But they didn't believe him. And the angels reminding them. Then what happens? And they remembered his words. It's like a bulb going on. In Hindi we say, Buski batti jal gai dimagi. Suddenly, like the bulb is on. Are ha, bola tha. Yes, he did say this, yaar. How could I forget? <laughs> and they remembered his words. Praise be to God. They remembered his words. Then what happens? And they returned from the tomb and reported all the things to the eleven and to the rest. So these women. They have been reassured in their heart. They remember now what Jesus had said. They encouraged. And they, in a lot of zeal and excitement, go and catch the others and tell them, Hey, an angel appeared to us and we saw that Jesus was not in the tomb. And though we haven't seen him, but we believe that he's risen. And guess what happened? You know, you think the others were very excited? <laughs> you know, we would like to believe. That they must have all got so excited and said, Oh, thank you, both the Marys, Mary Square. Thank you for all your help. No, <laughs> that's not how it went. That's not how it went. They did not believe the testimonies of Mary Square. What happened? Please now listen. Now, and we are being told about these women now. Okay. So I didn't make up Mary Square. Okay. There were really two Mary name women, two name, two women who named Mary went. Okay, so Mary Square did go, and no one then listened to Mary Square. So now they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James. And all the other women with them were telling these things to the apostles. Apostles, okay. Women are telling apostles and apostles not believing. <laughs> now that's not a nice thing to think about. And many a times we can have people 
who have met with Christ, they could see more profound truths than the clergy. And then the clergy needs help. So here we see these simple women, they have believed. But the apostles are now struggling with the testament of these women. <laughs> so they are telling these women, so Mary Square and other women were there and they went and told these things to the apostles. Then what happened? Oof, what strong words. Apostles are saying, this is nonsense. <laughs> we don't expect the disciples of God, the apostles to say to these women, this is nonsense stuff. <laughs> They are telling the resurrection, the news of the resurrection is nonsense. And these words appeared to the apostles as nonsense. And Jesus had told them when he was alive, that the Son of Man will come, the Son of Man will suffer, the Son of Man will be crucified, and the Son of Man will rise on the third day. And still these people who had spent so much time around Christ, even these women, to whom angels have appeared, reassured them, reminded them of the words of Jesus. When they go and report to the apostles, the apostles, they're saying this is nonsense. And they would not believe these women. They were rejecting the most important aspect of our faith. If the resurrection didn't happen, you and I don't have a faith to hold on to. But look at the mercy of our Lord Christ. Now we will read further how he personally appeared to many of them to help their unbelief. To help them so that they can go and tell the good news of the risen Christ. Hallelujah. And so take heart, precious ones, that if there are times in life where your doubts have become bigger than what you believe, Christ will still come to you. He will still send people. He'll come to you in many ways to reassure you of who he is and his claims and his promises to you. And he will strengthen you. Hallelujah. If you are truly someone who has met with Christ, if it's not an emotional conversion to Christ, if it's not an intellectual conversion to Christ, but if you have truly heard the gospel and the heart change, there was a true repentance worked out by the work of the Holy Spirit, then I say this to you, take heart. He will persevere with you. Amen. You will find him persevering with you. Like he persevered with these Apostles who told these women who had a testimony of the angels that this is nonsense. Christ reached out to these apostles because you see they had truly met with them. So if you're truly a born again believer, I say this to you, Christ perseveres with you. He's determined to help you. He's determined to take you forward. You know, many of us would like to believe that we are where we are because of our devotion. I would say we are where we are because the drawing power of Christ on our life. Amen. We are not here because of all the right moves we've made in God. We are here because there is a merciful God determined to take forward the elect, determined to take forward those who are sons and daughters of His. He perseveres with His own. There is the drawing power of God sent on the called out ones. There is a drawing power at work in our lives. Psalm 65 says, How blessed are those whom you choose to draw near to yourself, to your courts. They are ever praising you and they eat of the abundance of your house. What's the point? God keeps drawing those whom he calls. And we see that even with these apostles who are saying the resurrection is nonsense, we see... God, Christ, is going to draw them back and strengthen them and empower them and make them useful for His purposes. Hallelujah. And something interesting happens. Now, in the midst of all this, one fellow suddenly get, is getting a little excited. Peter. Among all this, so women are saying, to the apostles, we saw angels and angels reminded us of what Christ has said. We believe the angels. Apostles are saying, nonsense. In the midst of all this, one guy is getting excited, Peter. Peter is like, let them do all this. I'm running and checking it out myself. <laughs> interesting. Something interesting going on here, okay? Women are saying, 
Angels told us three rows. The apostles are saying, nonsense. And in the midst of all this, one fellow is getting all excited. Peter. And Peter runs. I'm going to check out for myself now. Hallelujah. So Peter gets up in the midst of all this confusion and runs to the tomb. He says, I've had enough. I'm going to check out for myself. The testimony of the women had some effect on Peter. Hallelujah. At least he felt, let me check out what these women are saying. And so he runs to the tomb. And he stops and he looks. Now he's really looking. He's really, really, really trying to figure out what's going on here. He enters this place and he starts examining stuff there. And he sees that the linen robes which were put on Jesus, they are there, but Jesus is not there. <laughs> now that excites him. And he saw the, now Peter got up, ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. Now Peter was not casually looking, he was really looking. <laughs> Precious ones, we cannot be casual about our faith in Christ. We really need to be looking into the scriptures to know more of our Lord Jesus. We really need to be looking closely Amen. at the rhythms of the Holy Spirit, mm. at the way the Holy Spirit moves. We cannot be casual. So here Peter is not casual. He is really looking intently. He's really trying to figure out what's going on here. And so he, he's examining the whole scene. He's examining it like a crime scene investigator. <laughs> he's examining it like a crime scene investigator. And he sees these linen robes. And he says, wait on a minute. We had, they had robed Jesus with this. The linen clothing is here, but Jesus is gone. And you know, that was enough to convince Peter. That Jesus is risen. That's amazing. Hallelujah. That's amazing. He was convinced. He was convinced after hearing the women and this. He had to see for himself. And when he saw, the linen clothes are there, but Jesus is not there. He was convinced Jesus is indeed risen. Wow. And, and how do I know he was convinced? Because of the word marveling. <laughs> he was amazed hallelujah he was like wow man this has really happened <laughs> but i find it extraordinary that peter would hear the testimony of women and listen um, women uh, their testimony had no value in those days please okay in the jewish setup at that time the test women's testimony had no value Today, praise God, your, your, you precious women, you're so precious, your testimonies are so much value, your votes are so precious, yeah, every party is going after how to impress you women. But in those days, it wasn't so. A woman's testimony had no value. So, Peter was fighting at many levels in his system at that time. And what's amazing for me, he doesn't even see the risen Jesus. But he sees just the empty tomb and he sees the linen robes. And he's so convinced. Jesus is risen. Hallelujah. That's amazing. And he's marveling. He's, he's, he's like, wow, man, this has really happened. Marveling. Look at this. He saw the linen wrappings only. He saw the linen wrappings only. Not Jesus, the risen Jesus. He saw the real happens only. And he went away to his own house, marveling at what had happened. I find this amazing. I find this is somewhere Peter really scores. Generally, Peter puts his foot in the mouth and keeps getting into trouble. But this time, Peter has really scored. Wow. The Peter is convinced. Women, some women are convinced, but the rest are not convinced. And the Lord Jesus is so amazing. He so comes after his own. Let's keep reading, please. Verse. And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Demos, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place. And they were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place. So they were talking with each other about all these things that were going on. <laughs> 
And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. Wow. Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. As we journey with confusion, Jesus himself appears and starts traveling and speaking. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So keen to clear, to clear the cobwebs in understanding. So keen to bring us into light. Jesus himself approached. You know, many a times we, many a times we go through troubles and challenges and we wonder, does God even care for us? God cares much more than we can ever imagine. These guys didn't know God was so concerned about them. The Lord so concerned about them. He approached them. So they're having all these confusing talks. What's going on? Yeah. <laughs> this is what they were talking about. Hey, what is going on here? What's going on? Women are saying one thing. <laughs> but you see, we don't see him. What's going on? Amazing things are happening. There was a darkness that fell when Christ was being crucified. I heard in the, the veil in the temple in Jerusalem has been torn into two. Kya ho bhai? What's going on? It's not matching up. <laughs> so they were discussing things and there was like a fog. It's like if I can say so. There was like a fog that had descended on their mind, on their understanding. And precious when I say this to you, when the challenges of this life, when the storms of this life, when they start affecting you and like, like a crazy fog start descending on your thought process and your heart. God is very concerned. He approaches and he, and he will clarify and he will send light to the ones who have truly met with him. Hallelujah. He does not let go. And so he is approaching them and he's traveling with them now and they, and they don't realize that Christ is traveling with them. So that means this risen Christ is looking different from the crucified Christ. <laughs> because they had spent time with the Christ to, before he was crucified. And they are not able to recognize the risen Christ. Okay, so Jesus is traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Mm, their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Very good. Then what happens? And he said to them, what are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? God is so concerned. What are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? He knows what's going on. He knows what a, there is such a fog that has descended on the understanding. And his God's questions are also redemptive questions. Yeah. Doesn't Christ know the answer? He knows the answer. His questions are always redemptive. He always wants to redeem through his questions. His questions are an invitation to an encounter. Even when he told Adam and Eve in the garden when they had messed up. Where are you? <laughs> it was an invitation that I can sort you out back. When Cain was messing around, God spoke to Cain. Why has the countenance fallen, Cain? God wanted to help Cain. God's questions are to help us. They are an invitation for encounters with them. And so he's questioning them. What are these words that you are exchanging with one another? And they stood still looking sad. They are so sad that their Lord Christ has died. This wonderful, wonderful teacher, the one who proclaimed himself as the Son of God has died. They're so sad. Then, if you're sad, this should encourage you. He's concerned for his sad children. He reaches out to his sad children. To comfort, to strengthen, to empower. And one of them named Cleopas answered and said to him, Are we the only ones visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? They are, they are thinking this fellow doesn't know anything, so he's asking them. 
in fact, in one thing he's saying, man, your GK is poor, man. You know what's going on here? Because he's not perceiving who is it that asks the questions. Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened in these days? What's wrong with you? What's wrong? You don't watch the news? Yeah, that's what we would say if, in our times. If something crazy is happening in the city and someone asks us, hey, what's going on? Let's say, don't you watch the news? Hmm? What's wrong with you? Don't you know what's going on? Carry on. And he said to them another question. What things? The Lord is, the Lord is asking again a question to them. What things? And they said, the things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word. They're not calling him the son of God. They're calling him the prophet. The things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, in the sight of God and the people. And how the chief priests and how our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. We were hoping that he will redeem Israel. They were hoping that he will set them free from the oppression of the Roman rule. That's their understanding. The old, the old Testament talks about the Messiah who will come and deliver them from oppression. And they put two plus two together and they thought it's going to be oppression from the tyranny of the Roman rule. But he had come to deliver them from the oppression of sin, Satan and his team and death. Hallelujah. And eventually through that, sons and daughters of the kingdom would rise who would establish the kingdom of God above the kingdoms of this world. But we don't have patience. And so they were like, they were expecting this Messiah is going to be a military commander, give them a great breakthrough with the Romans. But that wasn't happening. And so look at this. We were hoping that uh, he was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it's the third day since these things have happened. Then, but also, some woman among us amazed us. So there's all the confusion in their mind. <laughs> he was supposed to redeem us. He hasn't delivered. But some woman amazed us by a testimony of angels. <laughs> but some women among us amazed us. When they were at the tomb early in the morning, and they didn't find his body, they came saying that they have seen a vision of angels who said that he's alive. So these guys are being pretty honest with the stranger. And so they're saying, you know, on one hand, this great prophet lived in our midst. Great prophet. Did mighty things in, in deed and word. Great prophet. We were also thinking he'll redeem us, but he's dead. And then these women are telling us that angels appeared. And they're saying he's alive. So they're all confused. There's a fog that descend on their mind. And then what happens? And some of these who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the woman had said. But him they did not see. So they're also in one sense telling that that Peter fellow also went in. He also examined everything. But they didn't see Christ. So, the, so that they're torn apart. Like they're so so troubled with all that's going on. They're so worked up. Yeah. In our language, they're so worked up. Hmm? Then what happens? And he said to them, Oh foolish men. And slow hard to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. And he says, you're foolish men. You're being slow of your heart to believe in what the prophets have spoken. A lot of our heartache is because we are not believing what the scriptures are saying about God and his ways. 
a lot of our heartaches are because we are not believing. We don't spend time with the word to read and understand and perceive the ways of God. And so we have a lot of heartache and trouble. The mind that is not renewed in light of scripture is at war with God. So we can be children of God and still warring with God internally. Because we are not allowing a renewal of our mind in light of scripture. The, the renewed mind makes it easier for us to flow with the Holy Spirit. Renewed mind makes it easier. The Holy Spirit renews our mind and the renewed mind makes it easier for the Holy Spirit to flow with us. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit takes the word that you and I work with and renews our mind, brings our mind into alignment with God's thoughts. And then this mind that has been brought to alignment makes it easier for the Holy Spirit to work with that person. <laughs> Paul said, work out his salvation with fear and trembling. What did he mean? What did he mean? Work out his salvation with fear and trembling. With reverential fear, learn to flow with the Holy Spirit. And one of the most important things we need, if you want to grow in intimacy with the Holy Spirit, we need a renewal of our mind. Because when our mind is not renewed, we will keep grieving the Holy Spirit in so many matters. Every area where our mind is not renewed, we are going to keep grieving the Holy Spirit. The, the Holy Spirit helps renew our mind as we work with Scripture, and that makes it easier for us to flow with the Holy Spirit. So what he's saying to them is, you didn't renew your mind in light of what was spoken about me in the Scriptures. Our precious and many of our heartaches are because we are not taking time studying the scriptures. We are not taking time learning the ways of God and so we keep getting so many heartaches. A oh, foolish man, slow heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Praise God for the rebukes of Christ. Any amens for that? Uh, Pastor, I don't like the word rebuke. You know, I am very grateful for the kindnesses of Christ and the rebukes of Christ. The rebukes of Christ are a manifestation of the great love of Christ. It's only a loving father who rebukes his children. A loving mother rebukes the children. If you don't rebuke your child, they lose their way. So praise God for the rebukes of Christ. So here the Lord's rebuking them. You foolish man, you're slow of heart. To believe in all the prophets have spoken. Come on. Next. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? And now he's explaining to them. Precious ones, it was necessary for Christ to suffer and enter into his glory. There is no glory without suffering. <laughs> yeah. Then. Then, beginning with Moses and with the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. I find it very interesting. You know, he could have, he didn't need to do that. He could have just said, I am he. <laughs> but he took them through the testimony of scripture about himself. And many times we have this thought, only if Christ would appear in all light and fashion, glory will I believe. He could have done that to these guys. He's with them and he's still using scripture to open their mind about himself. The centrality of scripture, precious ones, is so important. There's so many people in our times who say Holy Spirit said this and Holy Spirit said that and many times what they say is nonsense because it's not in line with scripture. And then when I say, but this is what scripture says, but the Holy Spirit told me, I know, I know, I know. You're a fool because you're not weighing in what the, Holy, what the scriptures are saying. The Holy Spirit inspired the scriptures. He will never violate the scriptures. I like what one man of God, Bill Johnson, says. He says, let's walk as per the principled presence of God. There are people today who want to walk with the Holy Spirit and by ignoring the scriptures. You don't walk with the Holy Spirit by putting the scriptures aside. 
you lift up the scriptures, you and the Holy, Holy Spirit helps you, trains you, lift up the scripture. That's how you walk with the Holy Spirit. He never makes you violate the biblical principles. He is the author of this Bible. He loves the Bible. He will never give you a leading that is not in line with the scriptures. And I still have people sometimes who argue with me saying, I know it's not in the scripture like this, but I know Holy Spirit said. <laughs> and so they throw themselves into confusion and many others into confusion. Because they don't realize the value of scriptures. Even Christ, the mighty Christ, is opening up scriptures to these people about himself. He could have just said, I am he. But he said, I want you to know the testimony that the scriptures have about me. They will generate faith in you. Faith comes by? What? Hearing what? Yes, not opinions of men. Faith does not come by the opinions of men. It comes by hearing the word and the word of Christ. And then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he's taking pains to explain to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Hallelujah. Christ is giving them light about himself through the scriptures. He wants their lives to be based on the testimony of scriptures. Precious ones, our lives need to be based on the testimony of scriptures. What do the scriptures say? Mm. You know, even after meeting with Christ, I find so many people, they have great affiliations for their caste and their tribes than for, for Christ and the children of God because they don't understand scripture. When people, when Christ was teaching one day, some people came and said, your, sister, your mother is asking about you. What did he say? He says, these who listen to my word and do my word, they are my brothers, they are my sisters, and they are my mother. <laughs> so I find it strange because we don't take too hard what the scriptures say. We have such confusions in our mind. I come from the Jat community in Haryana, but you know, for me, a Christian is more precious than a Jat. But I don't see that in some of you. Because your mind has not been renewed about the issue. The Bible says you first do kindness to the household of God and then to the outsiders. Who is the household of God? The household of God is not my Jat community. The household of God is you who have put your faith in Christ. And then comes the Jat community and the others. But you see, we are so stuck with our own understanding of things. We are not letting God renew our mind. And we remain so stuck in our ghettos because we're not allowing the light of scripture to come to our mind. Christ said, who is my brother? Who is my sister? Who is my mother? He said, the ones who know my word, who hear my word and do it. <laughs> who is your brother? Who is your sister? The ones who put their faith in Christ. The Bible tells us, first you do kindness to the household of God and then to the outside world. For many of us, the outside world is more important because we are not renewed in our mind. Next. And they approached the village where they were going and he acted as though he was going further. Then. And they urged him saying, stay with us for it's getting towards the evening and the day is nearly over. And he went in to stay with them. He went in to stay with them. He went in to stay with them. What's the point? We need to hang around people if we are to disciple people. We need to hang around people if we are to disciple people. We don't disciple people from a distance. He was willing to even stay with them to help the heart and mind. Are we opening up our hearts, our time, our homes to people? Because we love them enough to disciple them.
Our past it hurts so much when you get close to people and then you try to disciple them and then they hurt you and it gets so painful and so. <laughs> and then, you know, I tried to be hospitable and they were so mean. So I'll not be hospitable anymore. <laughs> I've heard all these stories. Oh, but precious ones, how do we disciple people? By keeping them at an arm's length. Suresh, you will will engage at a level where you can never hurt me. <laughs> how, how do I help Suresh? Where my only engagement with Suresh is to an extent Suresh cannot hurt me. <laughs> it is an environment of being vulnerable that we are most impacted by God and we impact others. Christ was willing to be vulnerable with his people. God is vulnerable to his people. He expects us to be vulnerable with people. It is in being vulnerable and honest that you most deeply impact people. And yes, there are heartaches in the process, but that heartache is the prize to disciple nations. My mentor said to me two things. He said, if you want to impact people for God, you should win it with two prices. One, price of time with Christ, price of time with God. Second, the price of heartache. Are you willing to go through heartache in relationships to impact people? Relationships, the more you get closer to people, it will hurt. We will all, you know, who's coming for the first time today? Someone raise your hand. Yeah. Now this precious sister and this brother, they can't hurt me right now. Because I don't know them. They're strangers for me. But you see, this man can hurt me here because I care for him. You guys, this guy can hurt me. This fellow can hurt me. You guys can hurt me. The ones who I know can hurt me. When we get intimate, that's where we have the unmet expectation problem. <laughs> that's when we have the frustration problem. The people we love most have the greatest capacity to hurt us and wound us. Do you agree or it's going over your head? The people who are closest to us have the greatest capacity to hurt us. And if we, have to if we have to be used by the Holy Spirit to transform people, we have to get close to people. And you get close to people, they have the ability to hurt you. And Christ is saying, I want you to take my grace and I want you to persevere in the midst of the pain and the vulnerabilities is where I shine forth most in power. And so I love this. He stayed with them. He stayed with them. You need to pay the price of hanging around people, man, if you want to disciple people for God. He stayed with them. And when he had reclined at the table, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and he began to give it to them. So now he's baking the bread with them. Then, then their eyes were opened. Again, it's like the light bulb goes on. Are, yes, he used to do this with us before his death and crucifixion. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized Christ. And then he vanished from their sight. Wow. When he, he told them about himself through Moses and the prophets, he gave them a testimony of scripture. It was all adding up. And finally, when he sits and breaks bread with them, what happens? Then the bulb goes on in their head. Hallelujah. Then their eyes get opened. And then they recognize him. And he vanished from the side. So here we see two disciples, two people who were so confused, depressed. Christ himself approaches them. Christ takes upon himself to strengthen them by pointing them to the testimony of scripture about himself. And now, praise be to God, they have recognized this there is in Christ. Then what happens? They said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us when he was speaking to us on the road while he was explaining the scriptures to us? And then when he vanished, they're like, all along, our hearts were burning inside us. Were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? The Holy Spirit wants to explain the scriptures to us so much. Are we willing to pay the price of time with scripture? Then, 
And they got up the very hour and they returned to Jerusalem and they found and gathered together the eleven and those who were with them. <laughs> Look at the mercy of God. First, women are sent to the eleven who saw the angels. Now these two come to the eleven. <laughs> the perseverance of God. Can we say, praise God for the perseverance of God. Okay. Then what happens? And then they said, Here, Bhaiya, the Lord has really risen. Please, get it now. Because these 11 had rejected the testimony of the women. <laughs> so these fellows go to the same guys. And now they literally say, Are Bhaiya, okay, Sahib mein risen okay. Please, Mano. Finally, it's really happened, guys. The Lord has, it's not just risen, really risen by. It's really it's happened, is what they're doing. The Lord has really risen and appeared to Simon. Then, then they began to relate the experience on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. Now, this is, this is amazing. While they were telling all these things, Christ himself stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be to you. You know, they really needed peace be to you because it's like a ghost for them just appeared. It's like, imagine, we are speaking and someone just appears right now, zoop, here. And I can do with some peace be with you near it at that time, right? Imagine some fellow just appears right now from nowhere. It can be scary, right? And if that person then says to you, peace be to you. I'm like, hey, thank you. I need it right now. <laughs> and so he just appears from nowhere in the midst. These fellows are talking about him. And, they, and, and so these two guys, I think these 11 guys, are bhaiya, sahi mein ho gaya hai. Christ has really risen. And then Christ himself lands up in the midst. Like a ghost. They are like, and look at this, you know, they, they still feel he's a ghost. They were scared. And so this, suddenly this mysterious person has come here. They were so scared. And Christ is saying, peace be to you. Oh man, I'm telling they needed some peace at that time. Then, and they were startled and they were frightened and they thought they were seeing a ghost. Suddenly if someone appears right now from over here, we, you know, we'll, we'll get startled, frightened. And then imagine this Person who appeared also says, peace be to you. And they were startled, frightened, and they thought they were seeing a ghost. Then, and he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your heart? See, he knows our hearts. So precious ones, I want to say this to you. Why are some of you so troubled? Because of doubts that are rising in your heart. Take heart, God is bigger than our doubts. And he's here and he's in your life to clarify and comfort and take you forward. Any amens to that? Amen. You, do, you believe that do you believe that he cares for our hearts? Yes. yes. Do you believe he's concerned for our doubts? Yes. Oh, he can, he's so concerned. He's so concerned. He's so concerned. He's so concerned when we are troubled. He's so concerned when doubts arise in our hearts. He doesn't sit back. He does things. He moves behind the scenes. He does things to help us. Hallelujah. Then what does he do? And then he says, okay, come on. Guys. See my hands. They've really been pierced. These are my hands. These are the hands that were pierced because of the crucifixion. And he says, see my hands and see my feet. See, it is I, myself. Touch me. You can touch me. I'm not a spirit. You can touch me. Touch me and see, for a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones. And as you see that I have, you can touch me. I am, a spirit does not have flesh and bones. You can touch me, feel me. I am he. You can see the nail pierced hands. Then, and when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, and then he said, have you anything to eat? He still wants to help them. He's like, see, a ghost can't eat, so I'll eat and show you also. The pains God takes 
to help us in our doubts, the pains he takes to get us out of our troubles are just astounding for my heart and my mind. <laughs> so they gave him a piece of broiled fish. Then what happens? And he took it and he ate it before them. He so wants to help them, help their heart. He wants to convince them, it is me, it's not a spirit, it's really me. I'm the resurrected Christ. I ate in front of you, a spirit can't eat. See my hands, you can touch me, feel me. The pains God is taking, Christ is taking to comfort his people, to convince his people, to deal with unbelief of his people about his own resurrection. <laughs> Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then, then he opened their mind to understand the scriptures. Can we say this? Lord, please open my mind to understand the scriptures. Every time you go to the Bible in your private time, every time you hear a preaching or a teaching of the word, why can't we say Lord, open my mind to understand scriptures. Hallelujah. God is so keen to open our minds to understand scripture. Then? And so he opened, his, opened the mind to understand scripture. And he said to them, It is written that Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. You know, he had said this to them even before he died. He had said this to them. <laughs> then? And that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. And his point was, you are witnesses of my death, my resurrection. Now go and tell people what you have seen. And people who are weighed down by the weight of sin, help them, proclaim to them the message of hope and liberty. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You have witnessed these things. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you. What is that promise? Holy Spirit living in us. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from one. I remember the clothing. I said we need to be clothed for worship. One of the clothing for worship is this power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. And he led them out as far as Bethany and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Then what happened? Let's also see he ascended in front of them. And while he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried into heaven. They literally saw him, they literally saw him rising and ascending in front of them into heaven. Hallelujah. And he's going to come back, he said, the same way. So he was, while he was blessing them, and so, so they see that he's ascending in front of them to heaven. And he's blessing them, and he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. So Christ is alive. Hallelujah. And after that, they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. Okay. I took a lot of time to walk you through the resurrection account. Because the truth is, Christ indeed came as a man. He remained sinless. He walked so much in harmony with the Holy Spirit. He remained sinless. And then he died on that cross, not for himself, but for us. He was sinless. He died for us. And the resurrection is a proof that Christ did not die for his sins. Because, because if you sin, you can't be raised from the dead. Death cannot hold a sinless person. Yeah, death cannot hold a sinless person. So Christ rose on the third day. But for whom did he die then? He died for us. So that we don't have to be crushed and punished for our sins. God as... As even on Good Friday, Chris had said, God is loving and just. Yeah. God's, God's justice demands that if people sin, there's a punishment for sin. But God's love made sure that punishment is put on His own Son, not on us. Hallelujah. Praise God. And so we are told in the Bible that God put the sin of the whole world on His Son, Jesus, and crushed Him. The blow that was due for us, He put it on His Son. So we can receive forgiveness for sin. Yeah. He was bruised for our iniquities. Yeah. He was crushed for us. By his wounds, we are told we were healed. Yeah. Yeah. And so, the humiliation Christ went through 
the excruciating pain and suffering he went through, secured dignity for us, secured healing for us. Even the word excruciating comes from the cross. There was no word called excruciating before the cross. Excruciating comes from excrutius, which means from the cross. So the whole word excruciating, there was never a word like excruciating before the cross. There's never been such pain anyone went through that Christ went through. And so we have our word excruciating from the cross. All that pain he went through so that we can have healing and wholeness. All the humiliation he went through so we can walk in glory. Yeah. And so, so many things happened on that cross. And, cry, and, and Paul said, you know, you know, when Paul in Corinthians, when he went somewhere and he was hearing, people were not even sure whether they will rise from the dead and they were in Christ. He said, if you will not rise from the dead, being a Christian, then Christ has not risen also. And then we are most to be pitied. Because if Christ has not risen, then all our claims are false. And then Christ has died for his sin or for our sins. And so we have no forgiveness for sin and we have no eternal life, is what Paul was saying. So if you get time, please, you can go to 1 Corinthians 15 and you can read this account. So as I close, I just want to say this. The resurrection of Christ is a proof that he died not for his sins but for ours. Because if he wouldn't have risen, that meant he died for his sins. But when he rose, it was a proof he didn't die for his sins. Because death can't hold a sinless person. He died for our sins. And if he has been crushed for our sins, then we who put our faith in him, we will have forgiveness for our sins. Hallelujah. God put on Jesus what we deserve so that we can get what he deserved. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the punishment that was due for us was put on Jesus and he was crushed so that we will get now forgiveness of sin. Our curses were put on him so we can walk in every spiritual blessing. He was the one wounded so we can walk in health. He's the one who took shame upon himself for us so we can walk in his glory. He's the one who took our poverty mental, physical, emotional on himself, so we can walk in his abundance. He even tasted death for us, so we can partake of his eternal life. So many exchanges happened. He was even willing to be separated from his father, so we who were rejects and separate could be joined to the father and accepted in the father. The son of God became a man, so that the sons of men would become sons of God. The son of God became a Man, son of a man, so that we, sons of men, could become sons of God. So many exchanges. So many exchanges. So many exchanges. So many exchanges. He took our hopelessness on himself so we can have joy. We can have hope. The Jewish people, they were disappointed. Many of them were disappointed with Christ because they were expecting a military leader will come and set us free from this wicked Roman rule. But Christ had also come. He had come to give true freedom. He had come to give them freedom, to give the world freedom from sin, death, Satan and his team. And as people are raised up who are sons of the kingdom, through them, the kingdom of God is established and lifted high above the kingdoms of this earth. But we just need some patience. Things are working out. Things keep working out. Things are working out. God is at work. God's at work. So precious ones, let's just take some time now to think about and ponder on what we read, what we heard right now.